of the Sebastian City Council to order. Uh, we're discussing integrated pest management systems. Uh, so if you would please stand for a moment of silence and then do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Yeah, my mic is on, isn't it? Yeah. You can't, you can't hear that? Testing, one, two. Test, one, two, test, yeah. Oh, yeah, it doesn't sound too. Uh, Te testing, one, two, testing. All right, hello, testing, one, two, one, two. Try that now. Okay. Uh, I could tell, let me, let me connect to the T-coil here. I, I wear hearing aids, and I have to connect to the T-coil to hear much of anything through the mic system. Oh, okay, that explains everything. All right, now I'm on there. All right. Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear Council me? Member, Amy, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Um, the moderator today is going to be uh, uh, Daniel. Blodney. Okay. <laughs> he, uh, he works with Dr. DeFries, and uh, Dr. DeFries is not available, so he's going to fill in for him. Um, we have a lot of people here, um, actually a lot less than I thought we were going to have because I was anticipating through all the advertising. Someone even actually put a notice of this on my inside my door uh, the other day. So someone was actually passing out flyers, which is a good thing. Um, so I'm going to ask the people who had yet to address us at our last meeting if you might want to wait until the people who are new here get an opportunity to address us uh, today. Uh, that would be appropriate, I think. Um, our overall objective for people who don't understand is the city is in the process of trying to put together an integrated pest management plan to cover uh, the treatment of our canals and, and our parks and, and so forth. And we're trying to get public input on that. That process is not going to be automatic and it's not going to happen as quick as a lot of people would like it to happen just because that's the way governments work. Bureaucracies don't move as fast as some people would like to see them move. But our objective is to put together that plan. Um, and to, uh, to be able to come up with um, an opportune way that we can treat the canals, clear the vegetation out of the canals, treat our parks, uh, and so forth. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to the moderator uh, at this point and let him kind of take over on it. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So good afternoon. My name is uh, Daniel Kolodny, and I will be facilitating today's workshop. I'm filling in for Dr. Dwayne DeFries, uh, who he extends his apologies for not being able to be here today. He's appointed by the governor to the Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force, which is convening today. Uh, just a little background about myself. I'm the chief operating officer for the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program and the IRL Council. I work directly with Dwayne and manage primarily the contracts, grants, and financial aspects of the NEP. Um, I have a bachelor's degree uh, in marine biology and aquaculture from Florida Tech. I also have a master's degree in environmental resource management, also from Florida Tech. Um, I'm familiar with the issues uh, in the today's workshop. I also watched the entire um, video from the prior one on January 15th. Um, I am not here to voice my opinion about that workshop nor any of the topics discussed. I'm just here to facilitate this meeting. Um, but if you do have a question about the NEP and how it pertains to this discussion, I'll try to answer it as best I can. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the City Council and Mayor for hosting this workshop. I think it's a great opportunity for residents to make their voice heard, and it's a great example of how local government can engage its community and try to come to the best possible solution for everyone. The goal of this workshop is for you, the community, and residents to provide input and suggest ideas for the City Council to consider so their plan is a best management strategy for integrated pest management. So before we get started, I just want to state that I want to make sure this workshop remains constructive and thoughtful. When I call on you to speak, please come up to the podium, state your name before you start your comments. I encourage comments to focus on new ideas and management strategies for the council to consider. This is your chance to say something that has not been thought of or considered before. If you have a criticism or concern about a policy or other speakers' comments, please keep it uh, to constructive criticism. I understand this is a very passionate subject for many people. 
um, but I ask you to please rep refrain from comments that accuse or attack anyone. Um, with that, I'd like to ask the mayor, do you have any final comments? Yeah, I, I just have one. Uh, some people requested at our last workshop that we kind of do this in a circular fashion. And um, I, I've, I've had a, <clears throat> a lot of the same kind of experiences I think that they have, and it does work well. Our problem is we want to broadcast this and we want to play it back again on our YouTube channel. And with our camera structures in the room, uh, we weren't going to be able to do a, a good job uh, if we try to circle these chairs around because of the location of the cameras. So we want to make sure we get the speakers on film and that we get the moderator on film and so forth as we go through this. So we chose not to try to do that in that fashion for that reason because we want to make sure we can rebroadcast this on our uh, YouTube channel and that we can break and it's being broadcast today on our city t TV channel in preparation for the YouTube channel. So I just want to explain why we didn't take that up. I, I agree that's a, a, an appropriate way to do it if you can so everybody looks at everybody, but it's not something we could do and still and, and do an adequate broadcast. So I just want to say that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Carl, do you have any comments before we begin? Um, I do, but I think that uh, Councilmember Gilliams had a oh, comment. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Can we just get a roll call for the attendance? We didn't do the roll, do we call. Need a roll call. Well, it's on your agenda. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, let's do a roll call, please. Yeah. Okay, Mayor Dodd? Here. Vice Mayor Motti is absent. Councilmember Gilliams? Here. Councilmember Hill is absent. And Councilmember Paris? Here. Thank you. Okay, let me do a little correction on that. Uh, Vice Mayor Malte is actually in the building, but he's in a meeting right now, so he's going to be down here as soon as he finishes. So you can log him in when he comes down. Okay. So I just want to thank everyone for coming, and I appreciate any input you can give. As uh, Daniel said, let's try to be professional. Let's not try to uh, make this accusatory or, or a tax. Let's try to come up with a constructive way. This is your opportunity to provide information, as he said, for us to try to develop a plan, to try to improve our waterways, our parks, our golf courses, our, our common grounds. And so we want to do what's right, and we want to get the information. Not many cities do this where they give the citizens an opportunity to come out and speak. So I thank the council for, for holding these. It, it gives us an opportunity to directly engage with you all, which is what we're chartered to do. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. All right, as we begin this, who would like to start? Yes, sir. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody, for the opportunity to speak. My name's uh, Dr. David Cox. Um, I'm uh, a superintendent of Indian River Soil and Water Conservation District Board and a board member of Audubon, Florida, and Pelican Island Audubon as well. And I, I have two points that I'd like to make, um, and they really are subsumed under just one message, which is take advantage of the available expertise that is out there. and. Uh, the first is that we have an IFAS County Extension agent, Christine Kelly Bagazzo, who is expert at IPM. And she's, you know, on the county payroll. And you ought to take advantage of her expertise. The second comment is St. John's River Water Management District has done a lot of canal work and, and coastal stream cleanup work over the course of the last 20 years. And uh, Chuck Jacoby, who's on the Lagoon Council, is available for consultation. They have money. They not only have expertise in their staff, they have funding. And so those are my two comments. Thank you, great comments. Who would like to speak next? Anybody? Yes, sir. Eugene Wolf. So I own 160 feet on the uh, Collier Canal for the last 23 years. I was, on, I was a city council member during the Collier Creek uh, wall reconstruction project. And I actually have uh, footage of Hurricane Jean 
uh, of the waterway during the actual hurricane, which I think is a rare thing because often, I mention that because often it's said, we have to keep these canals clear in case of flooding. And uh, it would be interesting for any of you to see that footage because uh, when, when that creek is running, there's no weed stopping it. I mean, it was serious white caps and right up to the top of the wall, it was uh, a force of nature to see. But I just, so I kind of chuckle when folks say, well, you know, we got to keep it clear for the hurricane. Yeah, it takes care of itself. What I want to talk about is uh, my particular experience of 23 years. I've seen, you know, the canal from when it was never sp uh, sprayed to when in the last, say, five years or six years where it was sprayed on at least a monthly basis. One, so there's, so, and I've also witnessed four different methods of weeds being removed from the canal. So the first one I'll talk about is the spraying. You know, we always say the canal is being sprayed, but in fact, as an agronomist and being in my whole career in agriculture, and I continue to work in agriculture, the canal, the weeds are not being sprayed. In other words, when we talk about spray, we talk about an atomized particle. Uh, a spray droplet. So the solution is put under pressure and it's sprayed out and usually there's a specific droplet size that you're trying to achieve. In sophisticated systems you can dial in the drop size depending on what particular uh, insect or fungicide or weed that you want to target. What's happening on the canal is it's being, the material is being applied in a flooding fashion. In other words, it's almost like an open hose pipe. So when the applicator is on the airboat and he comes up to the weeds or he sees the weeds, he presses the trigger on his applicator and a huge stream of material comes out. So by no means is it atomized, which allows you to use far less material, obviously, and to uh, allow for a specific target. So what happens when you do the drench method, which she's doing, is you oversoak the plant, a ton of material goes into the water. The other method that I witnessed is, and this is most recently, is that the applicator will actually drag a line in the water and just spread the material out that way. I don't know if, if it's because he came upon resistance from people maybe shouting at him or I'm just reading into this. I don't know why he would have went to that method, but I have personally seen them uh, applying the material through an open pipe into the water. Both of these methods are inefficient, very expensive, because these materials are really expensive. I mean, they cost a lot of money. And uh, there's no way that anybody with any kind of training would be applying it in such a manner. The, uh, the applicator, I have to say, I'm prejudiced against the particular applicator who runs that airboat. I think he is not trained properly. I think his lack of education uh, is, is evident by the fact that he doesn't wear a respirator. He doesn't seem to take any personal precautions for his own health uh, risks. And the fact that I've watched him mindlessly drench things. Just, he just seems to, you never know rhyme or reason why he is, why the material is coming out the end of his wand. So that's the spray method. So when we talk about the spray, if we, if we ever do go back to spraying, I think we need to have an atomized particle that is a, a specific target controlled like you would have, well, like you would expect in the richest country in the world with the best agricultural system in the world. That's what you would expect. You don't expect an application like you might see in India or Pakistan. So the other method that I saw was people physically going out into the canal in waders to remove weeds. And how that came about was when we had the Collier Creek project, a $30,000 mitigation project was put in, which meant that they planted around the entire park indigenous animals, uh, indigenous plants and reeds to encourage the wading birds. And it was very, initially it was very successful, it attracted a lot of wading birds and the fish really did very well. 
but there started to become some weed growth. And with that weed growth, this particular aerial applicator single-handedly destroyed that mitigation area because he was spraying the reeds, he was spraying anything that he saw, flooding it, not spraying it, flooding it. The other thing that happened was the guys who spray the park, who come in with backpack sprayers, they also saw the reeds and started spraying them. So one day I witnessed this and I drove over to the park and I said to the crew boss there, I said, look, I'm calling the police. And he said, why? I said, well, destruction of public property. We just spent $30,000 to put in this mitigation and you guys are destroying it. So he got his boss on the telephone. I spoke to him and the next day he came out with a crew of uh, guys who, I don't know, maybe they're from Mexico. I don't know where they're from, but um, they were out in waders, about eight of them and they pulled the weeds out of, out of around the lake there. So that's the first time I witnessed, and they brought those weeds up into the banks of the park. So I've witnessed that. The, the third method is by boat. Uh, around the same time when it became evident that the mitigation area was getting destroyed, and, and I was concerned, and a couple of my neighbors were concerned about the decline in the fishing, we went out in a big boat and we, with rakes, and we pulled out the, the uh, weeds ourselves. It was very laborious. It took at least two people to do. I was on the rake. My, my friend, who's a little older than I, he was running the motor. And it was a difficult task, but uh, we did it nevertheless. Uh, an uninformed neighbor saw us doing that and called the police, and the police showed up. And we explained to the officer what we were doing, and he was quite happy, and he left, and that was the end of that. So we did that for a couple of days, and it, it was tough work. I, I wouldn't really want to be doing it myself again. Then the last method of I've, I've, my experience of removal there is via the spillway. And what I mean by that is like the dam at the end of the canal where the, where the Collier Creek now flows out into on its way to the Sebastian River. And there's a structure there. And most recently, I'd say about a month ago, we had a large invasion of duckweed. And it made these huge green islands in the canal. And these islands would float up and down the canal depending on how the wind was blowing. And I thought to myself when I saw these huge islands, I mean, they would cover, when they would congregate, they would cover up to five lots, so eight times five, 400 feet of canal wall they would cover. So it was, it was pretty big when you saw it. And I thought, you know, if we were spraying now, I know that guy in the boat would be out there drenching it all and really going to town. What happened was we got a, a, a very strong rain and uh, the canal raised up sufficiently for all that material to go over the spillway. And I know that because I went in my boat to see to see myself, and you can see on the other side of the spillway, it's all dried up and it's dead. So just to review again, four methods of removal, the spraying, which is really drenching, the wading via boat, and then using the spillway as a manipulative tool to remove. Uh, I would add one more thing. Since we have the moratorium on the spraying, when I've been out fishing, I've been going along the canal walls myself and pulling out any large weeds that are growing out of the panels of the, of the new walls there. And that's averaging two plants per lot. And uh, I've probably done maybe 10 lots worth in, in, a, in a leisurely trip down. I don't know how long it would take to do the whole canal. It takes him about an hour to drench it with the chemical. I would imagine it'd take it probably four hours to pull those weeds out of the walls by hand. Obviously, it'd take a long time for them to grow back, but that's what I can tell you about the canal after 23 years of living on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jean Gillette. I live at 193 Joy Haven. <clears throat> I live directly on the Alcam Canal, right by Barber Street in Joy Haven, second house in. I have <clears throat> been here for 25 years, 
and I've had several times that I've been at council meetings. I know our first discussion was regarding the, they took the water from the area that I live in, they built, built a dam at the other end, at the far end, and then the dam let the water stay high at the other end, but then the walls, our water is five feet down now. It's used to when we bought the lot, we moved in, it was right at the top of the wall. Now the walls are, they, they said they were caving in, so they were gonna put rip rock in. Well, when it came to that, the rip rock ended up under the bridge and that was it, and the rest of us, we were on our own. Now we have all the weeds and everything that grow up from the, from the areas that are now like little beaches down there but there's no way you wanna go down there because we have alligators on our side, a lot of them. I had to call myself, we had to have a trapper come out. He put a chicken leg on a, a pole on my deck that my husband built and caught an alligator and this thing had to be 11 or 12 feet long. It wasn't a baby. Then we have my neighbor who loves to feed the babies and I keep telling her I'm gonna put her in jail. So. It's not that I'm trying to cause problems, but I do see when the guy goes by and he sprays. I can understand these are people, these are animals and these are plants and these are bugs and they were here first. This, this is their territory. We came in and we took over. So we do have a problem. I had my neighbor came over one day and he said, oh my gosh, he said, you've got so many fire ants and he sprayed my whole yard with some mixture, he went to a do-it-yourself store himself and bought. I don't even know what it was. Next day, fire ants were all gone. So how come he could do it with one application, but the whole canal, you know, I agree. It's invasive and it's, it's bad for the wildlife. It's, and the kids, if they end up down there, believe me, they do go down there. And it's not, it's not good for anyone. It's, it's understandable that something needs to be done. But who's gonna pay for it? This is said that the canal belongs to who? Belongs to the city. I have that in writing. You're correct. So if it's going to be a problem of financial problem, would there be some other way they're gonna look at taking care of it? Are we going to take and move forward or are we gonna stop because somebody said, somebody said they didn't want the water to be lower on their end so they put a dam in, now our end is walls caving in. Some, it's gotta be an even for everybody. It can't be just this guy gets what he wants and you, it's too bad for you, you know? That's my, my, I'm not very nice, I'm sorry. <laughs> Joy, Joy. Thank you. Jean. Jean, yes. can I ask you, um, have you any idea what he put on those fire ants? I swear to you, I do not know what it was, but it was in a, he, he had it in a pump bottle, he bought it at a do-it-yourself store in Vero Beach, and one application, gone. But I can find out. Thank he, you, I'd appreciate that. He works at that. the police department. He's a We're looking officer. at the products for that right now. Right. Answer a big deal. And um, Dr. Cox, I just wanted to assure you that we're already taking advantage of the Indian River Lagoon Council's funding with grant writing and the co program program from St. John's Water. So all of these answers require money and we don't wanna use taxpayers' dollars. So we're doing the best we can that way. Um, if anyone's here representing the schools, I'd like to hear from them. Thank you, Gene, for that. <clears throat> yes, sir. I just want to ask a question because I, I live on the canal. Please well. come up, sir. What? You can come on. Come on up and talk to the. I just want to ask a question, that's all. A question. George, George, I've been on TV. I've been in the movies. Um, George Ireland, I'd just like to know what, what they are spraying. What are they spraying? Because I always wonder about that, and it goes all over my property. Yeah, please, I'm, I'm going to ask you not to do any applause while this is going on. It kind of disrupts the whole process. I know you may be happy, but smile yes, to yourself. You may be happy. Well, right now we're not spraying. There's a monitor. But does anybody know what it was? Because it comes when he comes by with me with that airboat, 
that thing because I my seawall is clear, and that stuff just goes all over everything. Roundup. It's Roundup? Well, well, I don't know if I'd get ahead of ourselves. Would the city manager care to chime in? And do we have our environmentalist here that we have on staff? Is she here? Kim was supposed to be here. I think she's actually in training this for the next three days. Yeah. Well, excuse me. I'm a little disturbed that she's not here. This was, this was scheduled. This is an important meeting to this community, and she should be here. Or somebody should be here in her place. So... Let the record reflect that maybe we need to reschedule two more of these before we lift the moratorium. I don't know. But we need to handle this properly, and we need to have expert advice. Go ahead, Mr. So it depends on what they're spraying. It's, if it's algae, if it's, it'd be, it could be copper. There's several different chemicals they use. It could be glyphosate. It could be 2,4-D. It could be a, a couple different chemicals. It depends on the targeted species that they're, that they're spraying based on what the, um, whatever the, um, the weed um, that they're spraying. It could be a, a couple different items. I know. I look across the way there, and it looks like Agent Orange has hit it. Well, so I don't know what it is, but I just assume it wasn't Agent Orange. I've been to Vietnam. George, maybe we have Brian here who handles our parks, and he can tell you what we spray uh, for fire ants. And if Brian, can you come on up and that's, share? But that's not that's not the canals. Company. Yeah, I'm speaking well, what, the canal. I understand. Okay. Not, All right. That, let's oh. just get let's just get the public input to keep rolling through. Thank here. you. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Who would like to speak next? Yes, sir. Hey, you know, it's Steve Jasdowski. I live on uh, County Lane next to a retention pond, and uh, Currently, it's being overrun by um, duckweed. Now, no one's mentioned anything about Asian grass-eating carp. I know it's been used before in uh, Florida successfully. They're not an invasive species because they, uh, the ones that they sell are sterilized. That pond was overrun uh, three years ago, weeds, and I personally pulled them all out. I made about 40 trips to the convenience center with four garbage cans at a time. And I cleaned that pond out. But that was a different weed. The duck weeds are just on the surface. In fact, I can show you a picture of them, but... No, I, I, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but they seem to be multiplying. Um, in the last month, they doubled in size. So, um, I, I think uh, the city manager, when he, he, he's produced some information on this, and you did look at the use of that carp for duck weight, did you not? So, there's certain vegetation that it doesn't eat, such as cattail, water hyacinth, water lilies. They'll eat grasses, they'll eat um, hydrilla, things of that nature. And duckweed, right? I'm not sure they eat duckweed. Um, I didn't see that in the list. They're less, it's a less desirable, but the, uh, the desirables are grasses. Well, can't uh, they be used in other uh, water systems? They have to be contained. They can't have a way out. So the, the stormwater ponds themselves may be a candidate for the carp for a permit from the FWC, but the open waterways aren't because they just go right out the spillway when the water raises up. So they have to be contained. But there's ways to look at containing them in other parts. There's, well, this is a retention pond. So they're like usable, they're, they could be used in areas of that, and we talked about that in the report. So we think it could be viable where it makes sense and where they'll permit them. All right. If you can send somebody down and look at it, it's County Lane. We, we know it's out there. We're under a moratorium. We're not doing anything until we get the moratorium lifted. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Who would like to speak next? Don't anybody raise their hand at once. Oh, all right, Mr. Stevens. Thank you, gentlemen, ladies, for allowing me to speak today. Um, there is so much going on here. This is so great that we're having this open forum here. I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, we can add this to the real practices. Um, I keep writing about these problems, you know. I'm a problem solver. I was an automotive technician and I was a teacher. I was a lemon law expert for the state of New Hampshire automotive. For 10 years I taught automotive for the state of New Hampshire. I taught state police and mechanics. and. 
and I loved my job, you know. So, but we were problem solvers, and when we had problems, we got everybody in the community. Well, actually, we could reach out to GM, Ford, Honda, everybody, and we'd have big round tables. We'd have coffee, and we'd have food, and we'd figure out the runaway Toyotas or the, the Hondas that were polluting, and, and we talked about stuff. So we were problem solvers, and when I'd have children come to me at the uh, teaching and the and high school kids, uh, Mr. Stephen, I hate, I, every time we come in here, there's a problem coming in the door. That's what we do. We were problem solvers. Unfortunately, you all are held by the, the, the sunshine law and it's hindering, it's making it harder for you. So I understand that it's very hard. So we really need to regroup and do something different so that we can try and figure this out, you know. And it makes me think about the first thing I thought, I, I could have had a long thing to speak. I know everybody wants to speak, so I'll be sure. Uh, I thought, remember Rocky and Bullwinkle? Set the way back machine, Sherman. And they would go after a problem. And they would ask their grandfathers what they did, and their grandmothers, and, and their great-grandfathers, what did you do? Well, vinegar worked good. Uh, steam works good. And then there are some magical things out there you can feed them. They're cannibals, they go down into the nest and they self-destruct the nest because they all die from eating something bad. There's a lot of things. I think Dr. Bob brought up uh, rice, other things. Well, I'm rambling on, so I'll go along. You all use San Francisco for a comparison, Mr. Mayor. That's cold in the summer. Uh, city Mayor, don't you realize, Cal, have you been to San Francisco? That's a, that's a it's I the have. cold it's the coldest winter I ever experienced in August. I think that was a Mark Twain thing or something. The answer's going to be a little different. Things live different down here. So let's let's use a apples and apples here, please. You know, and um, uh, round tables. I had a fire ant problem at my house, and this guy came out and he charged me like hundred and eighty dollars my first. Mr. Stevens, do you have a suggestion? Yeah. Please, please get to it. Thank you. And he, and he poisoned my property. And six months later, everything came back. And, and you know, they're in the business to sell chemicals. They want to sell chemicals to do with this. So I, as a problem solver, I said, let's use the automotive stuff into this. And I did the research, and I found out there was stuff they could eat, and I fixed it. I, I don't have any fire ants anymore. We had fire ants out here, the biggest mounds I've ever seen, and nobody ever addressed them either with steam, uh, uh, vinegar or anything. Why are we neglecting things? What are you recommending, Bob? Pay attention. Get some good managers to do the right jobs. And look at the right chemicals. Uh, Mother Earth News is in the library. All but you're reading it, so tell me what you learned, please. We can do this naturally. How, could you have any suggestions directly? Vinegar. Get professionals. Vinegar. When we do a study, why don't we use Vero Beach and Stewart and down south of here, maybe Orlando, though not, not, not California. We're not California. So let's use local places to figure out what the fix is, okay? So I guess, I guess that I'm lost and the mayor's smiling at me, so I'm going to sit down, I guess, here. That's because you're doing a very good job. I'm trying, Mr. Yeah, mayor, know but you know, you I'm, I'm ready to sell my Thank house. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. If anybody wants a house on a big, deep canal that heads the south, south. That's enough, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. You're doing a good job. Yes, ma'am. Hello. I'm Diana Bolton. A lot of you know me as a marine science researcher and a boat captain, but my roots run really deep here. I'm a sixth generation Floridian. My grandfather was a cattle rancher, prize winning, winning cows. I grew up in this area, went to the Sebastian Elementary High School, Vero Beach High, and uh, rode horses around in the orange groves. I'm really proud of our citrus industry and our clamming. We used to do a lot of clamming here. And uh, I'm here to help sort this mess out. Um, I, last night we talked about the uh, three chemicals you guys want to keep using for fire ants, and you're looking for alternatives. The three chemicals that were mentioned were Top Choice, Crosscheck, Advion. So I went and looked at the material data worksheets on those. By the way, I put myself through college. I have about 20 years of formal education. And um, my first job, full-time job, 
was working at a golf course right up the road here. And um, also I worked at a garden center in uh, Vero Beach, selling pesticides, giving people instructions on how to use them, selling the heck out of them. I was really good at it. I understand pesticides. I understand how they work. I understand what they're doing to the environment. And um, I also was the, uh, when I went to school in Miami, I went to seven different colleges and universities in three different countries. I um, was also the chief head gardener for uh, the second largest shopping mall in the state of Florida. So we used a lot of pesticides there too. Later on, my ex-husband was uh, flying uh, mosquito control and spraying pesticides all over everybody also. So I do have a little bit of background in pesticides. Um, I looked at the, one of the things we do is when we sell pesticides and we apply them, we use them, is we look at the material data safety worksheets and we see what's, you know, how they can be used, what's safe, what's not safe, and how they can be used. So I just took these three, and um, the three that we want to use on, on these uh, fire ants, and of course nobody wants to be bitten. We don't want the children to have fire ant bites, but we don't want them to have several diseases they can get too from the poison. So uh, top choice it says, and this is all like with five minutes of research, mm -hmm. do not use within 500 feet of water or endangered species. Allow 30 feet of untreated buffer. Okay, and I've just picked out some of these. There's like a lot of warnings in there. Cross check says hazardous to aquatic life and bees. And um, that's also confirmed according to the EPA, which you guys were citing last night. Advion, it has something that called endoxocarb. No more than six pounds per acre per year can be applied. It's a health hazard, causes parental toxicity, effects on embryo, fetal development, affects nervous system, kills water organisms, do not apply directly to water or areas that will run off to water. I'm familiar with this playground back here and when there's a heavy rain, the whole soccer field is submerged in water and uh, it also runs right next to a conservation area. So everything that we put on the ground or in the water ends up flowing into our, mm -hmm. not only stormwater system and ditches everywhere, but it flows into our so St. Sebastian River, it flows into the Indian River Lagoon, it flows out there to the ocean, and I've seen the degradation here. I've seen the de degradation in a lot of places, several countries in fact, in my job and um, in my observations while traveling. There is a solution to the organic, uh, there is a f organic fire ant control. Again, this took me five minutes of research, a little bit more to write this down and prepare for today. Um, and this is uh, stated by not just one, but three different universities. Mississippi State University, North Carolina State, State University, and Texas A&M. And it's limonene, which is basically made out of citrus peels. It's extremely toxic to fire ants. And hey, we have lots of citrus peels here. So this is great. In fact, maybe we should be using this as another industry in our area, which would be great, because we'd like to see more jobs here. So limonene. And we have a prime opportunity here. If we have uh, several, uh, a certain area that has several mounds of fire ants, why not experiment? I know we're addicted to what we're using. Spell it. Limonene. It's, limonene. it's basically lemon oil. It's spelled. It's and, and the product itself is called D dash limonene. L I, M O N, E N E. And there are so, several uh, marketing names also. It's under, but it's basically citrus peels, mm -hmm. and and citrus oil. Um, another name for it is called Orange Guard. That's a that's a mm -hmm. commercial name for it. And also, it's uh, listed as Monterey Garden Insect Spray. And there's probably other names, but these are all recommended at the top of the list by Mississippi State University, North Carolina State University, and Texas A&M. And I'm sure they've done millions of dollars in research on this. So um, <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to mention is in the IFAS manual from University of Florida on the Aquatic Plant Manual, it says in there specifically, and it's, it's not hidden anywhere in the fine print, but it says specifically that Roundup and also some of the other herbicides we're using, which are concoctions that also have glyphosate in them, it causes blue-green algae. Herbicide equals blue-green algae, which is cyanobacteria, which causes mycotoxic 
illness and um, dementia. Now we know it causes dementia and Alzheimer's. So um, we really need to stay away from that. Why aren't we using native algae eaters? Why are we talking about sterile fish? This area has been working out on its own for so many years before we came along and we tried to add all these chemicals to it. Do algae eaters not make money? Um, why not use native algae eaters? 50% of the, the fish that are out there are algae eaters and plant eaters. They love duckweed. And why do we think duckweed is bad? And why do we think plants along the shoreline are bad? Audubon International, in which I've provided that information for our local municipal golf course, um, recommends that you put plants along the borders of our water bodies. Why are we trying to spray every leaf? And if you work in, uh, if you're setting up a water pond at home, read a manual. There's some short brochures on it. What it'll tell you is you need a certain amount of cover on top. If you don't have cover, what you end up with is you end up with algae growth. The more we spray, the more algae we get. The more algae we get, the more problems we have. The more we spray, the more muck we have. The more muck we have, now we want to spend millions of dollars removing all the muck. We know that spraying it kills it, captures the nitrogen, keeps recirculating the old nitrogen, and then what happens is we ended up with the same problems that we had before, only it keeps getting spiraling and worse. So it, it feeds our chemical addiction. Why do we need to fear water plants and insects? We need water plants, fish, and insects in order to have a ecosystem. And the only thing that will clean our water are plants. That is the only thing that will clean our water. Spraying chemicals just adds to the problem. Yesterday morning, and the reason I wasn't here last night, because um, I was out in the cold yesterday morning and then I got drenched with rain, I was out on a recovery grove tour. I am really proud of our Indian River citrus. And I am saddened by all the gnarly groves. So anyway, long story short, they took a grove. I met with three scientists. I was, I was fortunate enough to be invited to meet with these people. One flew in from Texas and one uh, came up from all the way down from the panhandle. And what they have done is they've reversed citrus greening in a grove in Indian River County. They're using it as a demonstration. And they did it by stopping all the chemical use in that grove. This grove was a gnarly grove. They're the kind of groves that are being plowed under. And they're, you see them everywhere. They look like boneyards. They took a grove like that. And all they did was instead of spending 2,000 a year on chemicals, they stopped. And what they now do is they apply $500 per acre per year of micronutrients. They had to use foliar feeding, and the reason why at first, because the roots were all unable to uptake any, micro, any, any micronutrients. The same thing that happens to plants and trees, basically these trees have AIDS. Their immune systems have crashed. Their root systems are no longer able to gather uh, micronutrients, and so they become susceptible to every disease that comes down the pike. With the millions of dollars that the University of Florida has spent on research, there has not been one picture, one slide, one case where you can actually see what citrus greening looks like. Not one. And these three scientists confirmed this yesterday. There is no, it is only a symptom, and the symptom is identical to glyphosate poisoning. So anyway, I saw the grove by my, from, with my own eyes. I ate the fruit from that grove, and the grove is recovering. I have pictures of it. It's very exciting. It could really help our industry here. It could provide more jobs. And what's happening to these trees, this demonstration, is the same thing that happens with us. When we get swamped by air that's being sprayed around us, or what's in our food with the Roundup and these chemicals, our bodies can no longer uptake micronutrients we then, our immune systems crash, we then become more susceptible to every illness that comes down the pike. If I got an illness from eating a lot of junk food, it would be hard to prove it from, that I came from eating Twinkies, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of things. It's a cumulative effect of several different things. We have to do what we can here. We have a beautiful city. We want to turn it around. We want to bring the clams back. And we can do this, but we need to start using nature as our friend and stop fighting it and use it because it's the cheapest way to go. It's the healthiest way to go. And I plan to be here for the next 40 years. And I hope you all are too.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Please, no, no, no applause, please. Brian, did you get that information? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. That was some constructive ideas yeah, there. Thank very you. Good. Next, please. Who wants to go? Come on, people. Now's your chance. Come Mr. on up. Cox. Diane, you need a job? Yes. One that pays? Not here. No. <laughs> You didn't want people speaking early who had spoken the last session, but I, it's, it's all right. Okay. I had a choice this afternoon of watching uh, the uh, impeachment hearings or coming here. I'm not sure which is best. <laughs> sorry. I feel sorry. <laughs> uh, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, I gave uh, sort of a comments at the last meeting, and I don't want to repeat all of those things, but I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, first, the, the city manager asked if we can name, uh, suggest names to him for people to look at the test sites, if he's going to do wow testing. And one of them was Dr. David Cox, who I see has rushed out with his telephone, so I don't know if he's coming back at all. Uh, you have? I'll get on his case. Uh, the other was Jane, uh, Jane Schnee, and I don't know whether you've heard from Jane or whether you contacted her. Jane, Jane knows local plants and so does David. I think two heads may be better than one on this thing. <coughs> it would be helpful if you could sort of identify two and when you talk to them, here's the exact site where you want to go so that you don't just cast around in large areas and you say, we're only bothered about this one. Can't hear you, Graham. I can't hear you. I'm the mic closer. I thought we were close to it. I hate to touch it. It might right. explode on me. <laughs> Uh, I hate to come back to the topic of uh, fire ants and, uh, in the ball fields, but uh, what I did very quickly this morning was go over to the uh, IFAS site and pull out um, what they recommend, and I'm sure Brian's already gone through this site. But if folks want copies, I've got five copies or six copies. We can make more. I also pulled up the MSDS sheets. I know they've given put a new name for each of those chemicals listed, but I haven't had a chance to go through them. But I think it's worth everybody pulling up those sheets so I can give them to the clerk and she can make copies of them. It would be useful when it comes to the fire ant issue to ask what our neighboring uh, governments are doing, the county, the other cities. So I, you know, it seems to me more, get back to the more more minds are better than one. So, uh, Brian, if, if you're talking to them, good. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the county uh, commissioners uh, had presentations by county department heads about what they were doing to reduce use of glyphosate. Uh, that dis discussion, uh, there was a comment from one of the staff members that it would be useful to have staff level discussions on a regular basis between the county, the city, Vero Beach, et cetera, all of the local folks who are doing work on this so we don't have to reinvent wheels. And I think that was an excellent idea. And I'm going to encourage in all my discussions with county folks that they do uh, start doing that. Integrated pest management plans. I said this, I think, last night, and I've said it before. Education is the first step in all of that. If people understand what it is that there's a problem and what it is we need to do, then you can avoid some of the kind of back and forth that we had last night that didn't get us very far. Uh, if people know uh, in some way, you know, here's, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, and here's how we're going about doing it, and we say it re constantly, then uh, they'll start to catch on. There's no need to come in here and start uh, making you know, wild remarks if they know what we're doing. Uh, the golf course, uh, I shouldn't say this, but I think, yes, you should talk to Audubon International about doing a certification at the golf course. I think they, uh, um, uh, even though it's a different organization than Pelican Island Audubon or National Audubon, I think that they can give you some good advice as to how to proceed uh, to certify it. It's going to take them a year to look at it and look at all your ways of going at it. Um, 
but I think it's well worth the investment. Dr. Cox, can I, can I inter 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 sure. intervene? Um, Diane is a friend of mine, and I did call the National Audubon Society directly relating to their golf courses, and unfortunately they have a small amount of chemicals that they still use to treat their... Yeah. That's what they do. Just, just to be clear, Audubon International is yes. a for-profit business. Yes. Audubon, uh, Pelican Island Audubon is a separate 501c3. I'm aware of that. Yeah, and Diana National gave me the information. I think she's a good resource. Yeah. But they, I think they'll do a good job if you ask them to do something right. And my last comment is every time I've asked people, who, is there a good example of what to do with golf courses around here? They all say go to the moorings. And the moorings are really doing a superb job in all ways, it, both in fertilizer application or, or, or cutting down on it and the way they're managing their, their greens, their teas and all the rest of it. So the, the moorings are close by and I'm sure if there are golfers among you, I give you an afternoon out. Thank you. Did, did, did you say, because uh, Audubon International does, they charge for that and they actually, they use Roundup. They, 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 they actually recommend that product. And they, did you uh, say the Pelican Island Audubon Society might be willing to help with that process? Uh, you know, we are totally distinct organizations, but sure, Pelican Island Audubon will always be ready and willing to you know, come yeah. and put okay. in that too. Because that, uh, and it'll, it'll they, they would give us an opportunity to tell the golf course manager who to contact. Okay. About to get that information. If you might provide that contact, if you have that contact information. Yeah, start with me and I'll get to Okay. Because it. it'll help. And, uh, you know, all he's got to do is start the conversation about what does it take to do this. Because Audubon International, from what what I saw that personally, they don't solve the problem because they actively use Roundup. And then so it doesn't, that's not going to solve any of our problems I'm to, to do that. But if we've got another another Audubon group that will help us try to go through the process, it'd be, it'd be great to do okay. that. I, I just want to emphasize the difference between the two. One's yes, a, I understand. One's a for-profit and one is a not-for-profit. Yes, I understand. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cox. Yes, sir. My wife is going to kill me for coming up here. Don't be home. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. I've been up here before and I apologize. I'm kind of short in nature on, on speeches, even though I've fulfilled many hats. What's I'm the name, youngest sir? guy here, by the way. I'm about 81. Can, can you give us your name, sir? I'm the youngest guy here. I'm about 81, so I want to make sure everybody understands that. What's, what's your name? Bob Harkins, 662 Layport Drive, Sebastian, Florida. Oh, what's it, 32958? You want my phone number two, 581? <laughs> okay. First of all, I want to apologize to you, Mr. Mayor, about, I speak like Bob. I want to apologize for the mic situation because my wife has been after me for years to get a hearing aid, so that's why I said something about the mic. I know how to use a mic when I sing. Um, in the history of this thing, I've been, I invested in Sebastian 50 years ago. I bought land here. I'm, I'm one of those carpet beggars with kind of overweight, and I come from, from the Northeast, all right, forgive me, and I, that's a term you shouldn't use. And also, the, my relatives weren't here during the Civil War or any other spot, but I love Sebastian. I've seen what's happened to Sebastian. I've seen it change tremendously. i fulfilled many of the jobs up North that you people are doing here. I've been the head selectman, I've been served two terms, I've been on planning boards and all the rest of it over the years. So I've worn many hats. I'm a teacher retired teacher, shop teacher, in fact, and I hope they bring back the shop classes again like, like they, we used to have, because it's a mistake to take them away. I'm a hands-on person, all right? I've seen what's happened in Sebastian in many ways. I love it. What I say, I love this city hall here. I love the fact that you got a high school now. When I came here, you only had 2,000 people here, and that was it, and 12 mean old grouches. I didn't forget that either, and I was one of them at the time. Now I think you got more than 12. I listened to some of your, your board meetings and everything else, and you guys got to learn to listen to each other and not get so excited. That's what I was when I was a selectman. It was hard, because I'm, an, in a sense, an actor, because I was a teacher, and you have to be a good actor as well as a teacher. I'm impressed with what Mr. Wolf said. Thank you, Eugene. That's what, some of the things I wanted to say. I'm impressed with Diane, from what I've heard, just listening. I'm impressed with you two characters. Even though you both have each other's eyes sometimes, I think you can agree with each other. 
And I think some of, you, some of the things that happen, I'm not here to criticize you, but learn to listen and not get too excited. I went to a meeting last year down to Lake Okeechobee about this spring because I was very concerned. <clears throat> and the reason I'm concerned because I own two lots on Collier Creek. I don't know why they diverted the creek out to the golf course, but that's happened anyways. But I own two lots there, and I can see what was happening. I saw the wildlife that was there before they did the canal work, and I don't see the wildlife there now after the canal, canal work. And part of the reason is the spraying. I think there are ways we could control the canal if we got a pontoon boat and had volunteers that go up twice, a, uh, once a month or something like that to cut the growth that's coming up on the canal. I, I'd volunteer to do that, even at my age. I'd enjoy doing it. I still got my clippers and everything from up in the woods. Um, there are other things we could do to, to clean up the mess that's in these canals. The golf course is a different situation. I know you have to maintain certain standards and you have to maintain the lawn certain ways. But even there, my son worked there for a while, right here in Sebastian, and they got carried away with the, with the spraying. He even told me that, all right? So I don't want to get into that, but I, I respect your em town employees, your city, I should say city employees, I'm from a town. Your city employees, and I have to respect what they know and do, but you people are in charge, and please give them the guidance they need, all right? Uh, don't be afraid of volunteers. I was one, and I said I wear many hats. I'm bragging about myself, and I hate to do this, but I did wear many hats as an EMT if I am in the whole routine. So I know some of the things we were exposed to in those conditions, all right? Let's see, what else did I want to say? I'm, I am glad I got more than five minutes. Um, yeah, let's see. I cannot support the spray in the way it's done right now. If it had to be done, there was a proper way to do it. I spoke to my person that takes care of my lawns and everything, how they spray. He comes from the county up north of here. He said whenever they had to take care of a pond or anything of that nature, they'd only spray one side, not the whole pond. Eugene, uh, maybe you can reinforce that for me. Only one side of the pond would they do, and then they'd wait two weeks before they do the other side, so it wouldn't affect the vegetation or the fish that's in the pond. They wouldn't do everything all at once and overspray. None of that. All right, but that's something that he told me. Let's see. There was a guy that used to come here fishing all the time. He used to he used to right here in Sebastian for many years. His name was John Muir. I know does that name ring any bells with any of you? He's a naturalist from the West Coast. It was his uncle. And he loved the fishing out here in, in the in the inland waterway. He literally loved it. He doesn't come here anymore. He says, Bob, all the seagrass is gone. And that's what he told me. And the fish are gone down tremendously. That's why he doesn't come here. And he lives in Michigan. But what an asset to bring him back and bring these tourists back if we get, reclaim uh, areas around here. That's education that I'm surprised, like Gideon, uh, Gilliam said about the economic, uh, the environmentalist not being here. She should have been here, or he, because I've already been affected by her many years ago with turtles. So make sure you have her here too next time when we have a conversation like this. Uh, I guess that's about it. I'm not against development. I know Sebastian's growing. It has to be developed because of the people who don't want to come down here, like myself, all right? But control the development. Have some safeguards on your development. I think Sebastian impressed me with their building codes. I'm not so sure they impressed me with what they're doing with sewage and water. And I paid for that water line on my street too many years ago. Enough said. If you want me to talk about any of my hats like I did in school, I got a lot of them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hankins. <clears throat> May I ask Eugene a question? Eugene, um, we currently, and I agree, I've seen reckless spraying all over Hardy Park. I watch, I walk there, um, but that's applied aquatics. If we were to come up with our alternative solution to stop these chemicals on our, which is the whole purpose here, obviously, what kind of application method would we use for this advanced particle application? Can you 
identify that or go into detail where we could access that or learn more? So just, just very briefly, uh, even uh, the most least sophisticated system that you would buy would be a massive improvement over the drench method. I mean, there's companies like Micronair that allows you to, to get very sophisticated. I, I, I don't really believe uh, that's necessary. I think it, it's much more relative to uh, the production of vegetable or row crops. Uh, you know, what we're trying, what, what I want to reiterate is the, the basic uh, integrated pest management principles. And, and, the, and we know that drenching is not part of that, that principle. The other thing I failed to mention was that I have witnessed the applicator in dark clouds. It looks something like it looks outside at this point in time. He, he would apply his spray, he'd take his hour on the boat, and within 15 minutes of him finishing, uh, a huge, massive downpour would come where the where the lake would rise. I'm agreeing with you. Six, <laughs> seven feet. In fact, the last time I saw him, he was spraying. Well, the second to last time I saw him spraying, uh, he had to stop underneath the bridge that goes over uh, Barber Street uh, and Wimbro Drive because it was raining. So, ba again, go back to the basic principles of training and some type of sophistication. But in terms of the spraying equipment, again, it you know should have a pressurized sprayer that he can adjust the the droplet size to and not be drenching the entire water you, surface. Eugene, Eugene. Yes. If we were to put together a uh, task force, and maybe Diane and Graham and Bob and the, the, the people who are very educated when it comes to these chemicals that they're using, where you can advise the city manager uh, and uh, the environmentalist here at City Hall, would you be willing to participate in something that, you know, first of all, it would have to be fast-tracked immediately so that you guys can direct staff Obviously, you'll have to, uh, staff will have to bring it to council so we can lift the moratorium. We want to lift the moratorium, but we want to be safe to, safe about it. Would you participate so, in that? So the short answer is yes. As Dr. Graham uh, Cox uh, said, uh, we have an expert in integrated pest management in the county, so we should be drawing those uh, those well, we could possibly get them involved with the task yeah. force, but we need to put this task force together quickly. Uh, Diane, would you be a part of that task force? Dr. Graham? Volunteers. <laughs> Right? So, Mr. City Manager, if it's possible, Mr. Mayor, if we can get a task force that, to fast track that, this. That's got to come to council at the next meeting. Well, let's go ahead and uh, get it's a uh, consensus. Uh, that's that's got to come to council at the can, next meeting. Can we, we can't, get, uh, it's a workshop. We can't make any decisions or do any votes. In the I'm workshop. not looking to make any decisions, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. What I'm looking to do is get Charles. Can I get a consensus? That, that has to come to council I, at the I next meeting. I understand that, Mr. Mayor. I'm just trying to get a consensus. Councilmember Gilliams, that has to come to council at the next meeting. Can it, okay. okay. I have no issue with doing it, but we have to do it legally. I want it has to, do it to legally. It has to come to council uh, at the next meeting. Um, if you want to meet with the city manager and help him do put something together for the council meeting, put it on the agenda and bring it forward. That's no problem at all. Okay. But we can't do anything at this meeting. That's not legal. I, I, it's, I'm not. I, I'm not asking to do okay. anything. I, I'm not trying to bust your bubble. I'm just telling you that this is. Uh, Can I just this, get a yeah. consensus that? Three of us here, which is a okay, quorum, it, to, to, I'm not asking to take an action. Okay. I'm just asking so the city manager's here. He'll get it on the agenda. We God, can I wish I had an attorney tonight. here to talk to you again. <laughs> we can't take an action during a workshop. Put it on the agenda. I, 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 the, the three people sitting here all voted for the moratorium. They're not going to object to doing something. Put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Put together the paperwork. Get together with the city manager, place it on the agenda where we can deal with it. It's legalities. It's the way the city has to operate. Charles, That's you're not it against is. it, right? I'm not yeah. against it. Okay, Diane, you're not. I mean, uh, Mr. Hey, Gilliams, okay. Councilmember Gilliams, would you please quit trying to, to play games with the process? Well, it has to be on the next meeting. Okay, I. I it, it, it doesn't matter how you drag it out. This is the, the city is a formal government, and this government has to operate that way. Mr. Mayor, when you have people showing up at our council meetings and they're saying, "Why is this taking so long?" Uh, because of the procedures. Excuse me. I, 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 the, it, it's it's a it's a process that we have to follow through. It's that simple. And why it's taking so long is governments work slow. It's that the way that's the way they work. They work slow. I can't help that. We have to deal with this. We're, we're moving as fast as we can as a government. 
put it on the next meeting agenda, bring it forward to the council. That way, it's, that way we've satisfied all the legal requirements we have to satisfy. We have to, you, you have to understand something. We can't just create a committee. We have to charter a committee. We have to define the responsibilities for the committee. We have to allocate the authority to the committee to operate. We have to set up a process and procedure for a committee. That's the way the government has to work. It's the way it is. It would be nice, it would be great if we could dictate and say do it. I would do it. I'm as much of an environmentalist as Diane Bolton is. Yeah, Mr. I agree 100%. We shouldn't be spraying Roundup. Mr. I agree with that stuff 100%. Mr. However, I understand the practicalities of working through the government. I'm not okay? looking to create a committee. I am looking to create an emergency task force. You cannot do that. Is there the somewhere city in can't, the, the city can, can't do that? Show me Ask where. Ask the attorney. Where is the attorney? The attorney's not here right now, but you have to ask the attorney. So the environmental is closed. not here. That matter's closed. we go forward, please? Gentlemen, could, yes, let's please get back please on, go the, forward. on the floor. We have a question from a gentleman here. Yes, sir, please come to the floor. Afternoon, Ben Hawker. That was a nice ping pong match. Uh, the question I have, I'm in favor of a safe resolution for the vegetation. This meeting got a little bit over into the ants problem, which is a whole nother aspect. You're saying we've got multiple ways of removing the vegetation, one being a manual way of doing it. And the first thing I hear is it's going to cost the taxpayer umpteen billion dollars, whatever the number is. My question is back to we're governed to take care of our waterways by St. John Water Management. What is their directive that they dictate to us? I mean, the federal government tried to tell us to do certain things in a city and we said, no, home rule, go away. I don't know if that worked or not. But since St. John is really the controller of all of our waterways and they're telling us what to do, where is their specialist, their information, and their funding? Why put it in our pocket when it's a directive from a government organization? And I mean, my taxes are great. I came from up north. <laughs> I paid 10 grand in taxes up there on a home. I'm paying a grand and a half here. That's pretty good math in my book. But again, you're looking at taking all of the properties, increasing it due to manual labor or new equipment or machines, et cetera. Where is the funding that should be coming from St. John's Water? And I'm, I'm not aware of what that actual contract is, what we're directed to do or not to do. The city so, manager can address that if you, about St. John's, but well, what, I, I, I will tell you, we're gonna, uh, once we come up with the process, in order to apply for a grant, you have to show them exactly what you intend to do. So we're going to apply for grants, and hopefully we're going to get enough money from the grants to be All able right, to do Getting this. enough money from a grant is one thing, but I'm looking at the fact that we are being directed by a organization that says, you will do this. Now, since I'm being told what to do, I should be told what to use, how to use, and here's the funding to do it to keep our waterways clear. Let's let the city manager address that because that's not, it would Thank be great you. if it worked that way, but it doesn't. Yeah, that's well, unfortunately. I see no reason it shouldn't. Yeah. Well, so St. John's issues you a permit to construct the waterways under these conditions. They, if you want to build the canal, you want to build the water structures, you will build it and you will follow these conditions. And some of those conditions are maintaining invasives, coming up with a plan to maintain it. They don't provide funding to maintain something that you want to construct. It would be similar, maybe not so much as we provide you a permit to build your house. We don't give you funds to maintain it. We tell you through codes how you're supposed to maintain it, but the city doesn't fund you to paint your house or fix your roof. They don't fund the removal of the weeds and the vegetation. They give us guidelines. We can use mechanical, we can use chemical, we can use other methodologies. They don't dictate how we do it. They just want to make sure that we do do it. That helps. That's it. Thank you. All right. Would anybody else like to speak? Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Patty Augustin, 685 Wimbro Drive in Sebastian. My first city council meeting ever. Uh, but this was important enough to me to, to come down. I actually work out of my home and uh, snuck out of my work office and my house to come down here and listen to this. Um, as everybody here has not raised their hand, I also, you know, I'm certainly not in favor of, of uh, using Roundup or other uh, pesticides or herbicides. I just wanted to state that for the record. Um, my business is drinking water filtration. I've been involved in drinking water filtration for 25 years. And um, I'm helping large OEM manufacturers make uh, carbon block filters to take out of the water all the things that we're putting in. The, you know, the 2,4-D and, and uh, all these carcinogenic chemicals. Uh, so I just find it kind of interesting or going around the horn completely that, that I've been doing something for 25 years to take stuff out and, and now I'm sitting in a council meeting where we're talking about whether or not we want to put it in. It's so obvious that we can't poison ourselves and poison our environment. Um, it's a slow death. You know, we don't see it right away, but it is a slow death. And chemical after chemical after chemical is being, you know, identified by the EPA, by the Water Quality Association. There are, there are many outfits out there, uh, nonprofit outf outfits that are out there that, that are showing us that this is a problem. So I, I really applaud some of the folks who have come up with ideas. Again, I only heard about the problem recently when I got a little leaflet in my door and said I need to come down here and, and find out what's going on. I didn't have enough time to research because I didn't know what the problem was other than we were going to be talking about the chemicals we were putting in. Uh, one of the gentlemen talked about the spraying or the overspraying or the uh, fire hose method. I have witnessed that myself um, and have pulled my dogs back in the house every time that boat comes by, that air boat comes by because it is just not right. You can't spray chemicals like that and, and have it be safe for our families, for our pets, and for those waterways around here. So I appreciate the time, and uh, you know, as time goes on, if there are things I can do to help, I, I might be interested in maybe joining that task force. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Patty. Does anybody else have any comments? Mr. Stevens. I'll try to keep it brief and be nice. Same point, Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, answers. Uh, Councilman Parrish, you, you wanted some answers to it, to the problems here. Uh, ask the staff to stop getting educated. You know, there are some, in this county alone, we have, we have symposiums, we have panels, we have educational movements. You can check with Dan constantly on what works, what doesn't work. If you, you could go to Melbourne, go to the MRC, all the time there are educational forums going on. I've never once seen anybody from the city of Sebastian. There was an EPA educational seminar here in August. No one from y'all's organization. My suggestion is you start getting education to the, and open up some liberal people in our, in our organization here. Thank you for what you do, but we're, we're not doing enough. We're doing too much. And as Diana said about the scientists in those groves yesterday, that was mind shattering. It was stop poisoning. Stop. And the orange trees came back. How bizarre, huh? So we've witnessed some things. Please get this stuff straight. If you can't do it, Paul, you should, you know, find somebody that can because this is this is insanity. And we've got is it right that we have somebody in this business of, of selling chemicals, making, helping make these decisions? Who's that? We're not supposed to use names, right? But I believe there's somebody in the voting organization that makes decisions for this, for this panel that, that uses these chemicals for a living. Okay. It, but we don't need I, to go I'm into gonna, that. I, wait, we, I'm, I'm gonna, just saying. If, if let that, me, ad let me if address that. If that's the truth. Let me address that. Okay. Okay. The individual that you're talking about has a business in which he puts irrigation systems in golf courses. 
Yes. That's his business. Right. He also has a degree in golf course management, yeah, grasses, yeah, 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 and so yeah, we forth. We know all that. That's his business. Okay. So, so I, I'm not, I, I don't see a conflict. He has, this is, this is the dichotomy we're caught up in. Okay. This is where the science has an issue. He believes here, you believe here. And the problem is the two of you won't ever come together. You want to smack each other all the time. You want to smack each other all the time. You want to smack each other all the time. It doesn't solve the problem. Oh, no, I know that. It I doesn't solve the problem. I'm sorry So that, somebody that has to way. be the big person and quit smacking, and I'm glad you're doing that. Uh, I'm, 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 because yeah, you I'm, actually I'm sorry. are. You're, I'm you're, sorry. You're presenting good information, and I'm you're doing you a very please, good manner. I'm asking you, please, Mr. Mayor, be open-minded and stop yes. going to these symposiums. So, the symposium coming up. I, I, I agree with you city, Direct your city manager. If there's a, yeah. an all-day seminar on how to get money, what the problems are and what they aren't, yeah. in this building, okay. in this room, so, so, please send, tell him to show up. Let, let's quit smacking each other. Let's quit that. I'm oh, sorry. Do you agree with that? Right. Okay, let's quit it. Let's let's try to be productive answers, and proactive. Okay. okay. So thank you, sir. Okay. So so I guess that I'd like a real round table where we could go over the problems like we did when we when we trying to fix the runaway Toyotas, the world couldn't fix it. We fixed it in a round table, Mr. Mayor, by talking to each okay. other. Okay. I I I these I've, talk shows aren't working. Okay. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, he, he is right, you know. We uh, well, ordered, excuse me, please don't interrupt me because I want to just make my point real make quick. Make your point, make your point. We scheduled two workshop meetings to invite the public here. He's, Jim Hill is a paying councilman. He should not just blow these meetings off. This is serious okay. stuff. And he's not here, he's been not here for both meetings. So and, and let the record reflect that. Just let the record I, I reflect think that. It, it does reflect the fact he's not here. I, Twice. I, that's fine, and it does reflect He gets that. paid to be here. Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Steve Palmquist. I'm on the board of directors of Pelican Island Audubon. Sorry, I, I got here late, so I don't know what all the comments were. Maybe I'll be duplicating uh, the comments. I don't have an answer for how to um, do the maintenance that you're talking about without using that chemical glyphosate, but um, I just want to remind everybody that unlike in the pharmaceutical industry where before you, can, uh, before you can sell a drug, you have to get the FDA to approve it, in the chemical industry, all of us are guinea pigs. They don't have to get any approval before they uh, use their chemicals all over the country. We just have in today's news that 43 major American cities um, have serious problems, including the city of Miami, have serious problems with PFAS in their drinking water. It's a different chemical, but the point is the same. That chemical has been used since after World War II, since, yeah, right after World War II, and every single person who's ever been tested has that in their blood. You have it, I have it, Everybody in here has that chemical in their blood. It's a, a carcinogen. And it won't be too long before we find out that we all have glyphosate, glyphosate in our blood. So I know that you're trying to find ways to get rid of it, and that's, that's good. That's what we need to do. But um, just keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, now, if, if you're going to speak again, I'll apologize, because I, 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 you probably lost some cr credibility when I said I was as big an environmentalist as you are. So, uh, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Mayor Dodd, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you for the, the honorable mention. Um, three more points I want to make, and one is about the glyphosate that might be in our blood. It already is, and it's even in fetuses' blood. Um, <clears throat> I have three points to make here that I... I that were stimulated by other great comments and um, also one of the things we're not we're not taking advantage of are the assets that we have in the county the I, I recently toured the stormwater park in Osprey Osprey stormwater park and you've probably heard me mention that at the last meeting but uh, the plantings and the buffers and the fact they're even using water lettuce 
to uh, clean the water. And our stormwater park here, we have a much bigger stormwater park. It's our stormwater park has great potential. We have an opportunity here to really make it more aesthetically pleasing, more beautiful, and so it'll be used more by our residents. And a lot of people don't even know it's there. 166 acres and five ponds, and yet we work and we pay money to spray every blade and anything floating in that that those ponds as if it's an enemy, and it's not. Those plants filter our water. It's a stormwater park designed to clean the water, so why in the world would we be dumping chemicals in it? When they weren't dumping chemicals in it to kill the plants, they were using something called blackout, which to keep out the algae growth. Well, the algae is growing because of the nutrients in the water. The more we spray, the more nutrients we are creating. And these sprays, a lot of them are also patented not only as herbicides, but they're patented as fertilizers and antibiotics, which we don't really want in our water. So over time, they convert into fertilizers, and also they create more fertilizers by killing, rather than if we, want to, if we have a huge overgrowth of anything, we can harvest it mechanically, pull that out, and that becomes excellent fertilizer. Um, in reference, that's the one point. Uh, Point number two, on the Audubon International, I don't think there is no one, uh, you can never agree with anyone 100% of the time or agree with any program 100% of the time, but even I agree with uh, Dr. Cox, Audubon International, the re reason it came on my radar is because I looked at uh, water quality readings that were done in Vero Beach and there was a blue spot and the blue spot was not right next to the uh, Moorings Golf Course. And I asked, why is there a blue spot there? You would expect it, because we all know golf courses use chemicals. You're never gonna get away from golf courses using chemicals. The fact that Audubon International mentions Roundup doesn't mean that it has to be used. It would be like if you have a recipe for something that calls for cilantro. You don't like cilantro, just leave it out of the recipe. So you can pick and choose what you want to. The fact is, I, when I read those testimonials and went on that website, it's only $300 a year to belong, plus I think it will increase our memberships and hopefully reduce our deficit. Our golf course is costing us a million dollars a year. Let's bring in more members. Let's get more people playing on it. Let's make it more beautiful. Let's have the, the wildlife and the birds there too and the flowers and whatnot. But um, I don't think that we should uh, discount them uh, or disregard them because of the fact that uh, that's listed on there. It doesn't mean you have to use it. On the testimonials that I read on the successful golf courses that are Audubon International certified, they're using one third of the chemicals they were using before. Hey, that's great. We're not gonna eliminate chemicals entirely. We're not gonna break that addiction 100%. Homeowners are allowed to do whatever they want. People <laughs> always poison themselves. Mm -hmm. There'll always be a chemical company that comes along <laughs> and sells us another thing. Which reminds me, the CEOs of these companies and the man municipal managers and the governments of these uh, uh, different towns and cities and counties are not expo getting exposed to these pesticides the way the workers are, in including golf course workers and these pesticide companies that we are hiring. Um, the studies that I read even this morning show a threefold increase in cancer and one study showed a six-fold increase in cancer. And what, what caused me to look this up was there was a blog this morning about last night's meeting and today's meeting. And someone who's in the pesticide business here in our town was bragging about how he never used protective gear. He's been spraying it for 20 years and didn't see any problem with it. Bless his heart. I really think he needs to cover up. All these material data worksheets say that you should wear protective clothing, that you should wear a mask, that you should wear protective eye, eye goggles. And in these studies that I read this morning, these research studies, it states um, specifically bladder cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, melanoma, pancreas cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, prenatal risk, infertility, and birth defects. And some of this stuff is coming right off the material data worksheets, and these are some of these are printed by the companies that are trying to sell this to us. They're the marketers. So a threefold to sixfold increased risk of these diseases to these workers. So let's get real about this. It, we, there's so many other things we can do. And thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Do you thank have any questions? Okay. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. Do you have any other speakers? This is your chance to get your voice heard. With you have constructive suggestions? Yes, sir.
Yes, Dr. Bob Betta. And uh, I think there have been a lot of uh, very good comments and suggestions here today. Um, one thing that I, I would like to suggest that's a little bit different is that uh, since the since the, uh, the the ban on pesticide use was limitedly lifted last night in favor of killing these fire ants, why don't we uh, why don't we do like was done with uh, the Wow product and the Roundup product as a side by side type of thing? Why don't we uh, address some of the fire ant populations with the uh, some of the natural things, the non-toxic things that were suggested, and give them certain color-coded flags by the mounds, if you will, and then <clears throat> use the some of the chemical agents, which unfortunately right on the label talk about the fact that they can kill birds and bees and invertebrates. Uh, these are the kind of things that I recommend so strongly that we don't use because of their impact on all of nature. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Can I answer that? Sure, go ahead. I did instruct Brian to, to test some of those things that we heard about last night on some select fire mounds and take pictures daily and see how it progresses. Okay, and let's, uh, let's add that. Thanks, Paul. Let's add that lemon product or whatever it is to that. To that yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, I can't get a Wi-Fi here for some reason, but this Orange Guard, I've heard of it. It sounds local and easily yeah. accessible. If we can Google some of these, Limonier, Orange Guard, and the, uh, yeah. what was the third? Okay. If I may, Mr. Mayor, the, the spray company was using that. It also is a herbicide, a fast burn herbicide, too. So. When we use it on the fire ant mounds, we also have to be careful that we don't kill all the grass. Oh, okay. All right. So it Thank also you. is used as herbicide. I didn't realize that it was a herbicide it, also. It, it is used as, so it has several uses. It's a decreaser. It's a very good product for. That's where I heard it. It does Orange a lot burn. of good things, um, yeah. and it is natural, but it also has a tendency to burn skin and that. But okay. everything has a trade off, right? So. But can't we a, spot treat the mounds without affecting we can. the. And we're going to we're going to do some some test areas with the natural things. Shouldn't uh, affect the grass then. Well, it, it will where the mound is, but yes, we're yeah. going to look at it and see how it progresses. But okay. thank you. Because obviously, when and first of all, thank everybody for being here. I really appreciate you. I was wondering where you went after the election, <laughs> because um, I had I spent the summer in chemotherapy, and I don't want chemicals here either. <laughs> um, I don't want anybody to get sick. But um, you know, I think we all agree that we don't want these things. The point we're gathered here together in unity is to find solutions that are good for us. And there's no reason to fight about it. I think we all agree we only want a good, healthy quality of life here, right? So thank you so much for bringing all this up. Mr. Mayor, I Sir. also want to mention that Paul and Jeanette staff, they uh, were able to locate a stormwater asset map. I'll be happy to share after the meeting to lay out all of our canals, our stormwater park. Um, it's very interesting, it's color coded, and I have a larger version that they, they have gotten me. We're gonna to try to get it posted somewhere in the community so people can come to that map and see exactly what we're up against. Now, Mr. Mayor, with your permission and um, the facilitators, I see uh, Zito from the county here. Is there a way we can get you to come on up and? And give us a word or two about what the county's doing. And, and while he's coming up, that map is actually on the website also. So if anybody wants to go yeah. out to the website and do a look up uh, under uh, the laser fish thing, they can get to that map and then they can look at it on a computer and blow it up and get to good level detail play with it. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I, if I may, Mr. Mayor, we can make it easier. We can put a link from the stormwater website to that map so they don't have to go search it. All right, that'd make it easier to do that. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, Council. Mr. Carlisle, Mr. Glodney, uh, Michael Zito, Assistant County Administrator, Indian River County. Uh, I have um, three members of county staff here who um, apply certain techniques to manage their responsibilities. Um, one is the Public Works Director, as you know, who manages our medians right of way, um, maintains um, those areas with various techniques that do not include application of glyphosate. Uh, we also have our parks director, Kevin Kerwin. Our public works director is Rich Spirica. He's in the back. And um, Kevin Kerwin is here by my side. And Beth Powell manages 
3,800 acres worth of conservation lands and does um, strategically and surgically apply certain chemicals when best management practices that she has studied and is licensed to apply uh, make sense. And so we're only here to answer your questions and tell you what we do, of course, not to influence your collegial body in its effort to manage this problem, okay? So we are here, I'll, I'll ask uh, Kevin to start with um, our Parks Division. Thank you, Zeno. Kevin Kerwin. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Council, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, if I could just say something, we're also here to learn. I mean, I wanna applaud this process. Um, I like the fact that you're including all your residents and your staff that came today. Uh, the thing that I like about it, it's what we do on parks and conservation lands is only a small piece of the pie. If you go anywhere else, everybody's got a yard and everybody's got an area that they have to take care of. Now, on parks, the only thing that we're really applying, and I know this came up last night at your council meeting, is we, we apply top choice to treat fire ends. If you have any questions, I'll... What is the main chemical in top choice? That it's you know, I'd have to look it up. Fino, Fino uh, Brian, I'm sure that, Perfect. yeah. Perfect all, thank you. And so, it's not and used in food products as well? Um, I do not know, I'm not a chemist, and, uh, but I can tell you that we use it very surgically and we use it proactively um, and we use it in such a way that it's we, the minimal amount is sprayed. So it's not, not like it's doused or dredged or any of that type of application. So, so what do you do for uh, like weed control in your ball fields and stuff like that? Cut the grass more. You cut, you, so, you, is that uh, it? you cut it shorter? Very yeah. good question. No, sir. Um, is in uh, Bermuda grass? And I'm, I'm at, how much time do I have? Because I can go all about, day. You got until so, 4:30. So you, you, you're in good 430? shape. To 430? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it before that. that. Okay. So, the main thing that with Bermuda turf grass, yeah, to keep the weeds out of it, you need you need to cut it more often. But you, uh, do you fertilize it? Um, we, if you cut it more often with a mulching mower, you only need to fertilize it if you have a shock event. Okay. Shock event here in Indian River County would be something like uh, a deep, a deep frost or deep freeze, or maybe if it's close to salt water or brackish water, if you get overspray, and then you would have to fertilize. Um, and then when you fertilize, I mean, you can use natural fertilizer like morganite that doesn't contain any chemical compounds in it. It's all organic, and then you spread that, and uh, that helps your fields out. Okay. Uh, what I recommend for cutting a baseball field, a football field, a soccer field, uh, is usually two times a week, and that's during the growing season. Are you looking for an alternative to uh, top choice at all? Well, I'm, I can tell you we, we are always looking for alternatives. Uh, and an integrated pest management system is a living system. It's not a document that you drop on a table one day and say that's it. Uh, it's the type of thing that we'll, we'll try everything and anything. And from the park and recreation perspective and the conservation land perspective, I mean, we try these things. The first thing is to cut cost. I mean, this stuff is not cheap. So, um, you know, we do that to, to save our budget so we can spend it on other great stuff. Well, just for the record, uh, and I'm looking it up uh, under the EPA, top choice, Florida applications. Do not use this product within 500 feet of areas occupied by threatened Florida scrub jay, blue tail, mole, slink, skink. Sand skink, in addition for the protection of the threatened blue tail, mole sh skink, and sand skink, apply only to turf grass and allow at least 30 untreated buffer of turf grass when adjacent to scrub jay habitat in the following counties, so on and so forth. Department of Agriculture Consumer Services for the application to urban turf for lawns in Florida, follow the best management practices for protection resources. And this uh, was posted um, just recently. 
Um, so it's, it is harmful to the bees, to the birds. Uh, well, we file, we file the label whenever we apply this product. You do? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Good. You didn't take it 4.30, it's not, you still get more time. Is you there have anything to else besides more. your parts? Well, I can tell you that I've also heard today that uh, I, I like the idea of discussing um, amongst parks professionals and conservation land professionals. I mean, I like the idea. I came up, I mean, I like the conversation. I like what your residents are bringing to the table, so. I, I, I think it might be a good idea to try to, to get together with the, the county commission and some of the, uh, some of the other municipalities and try to set up a task force similar to what they've got, you know, like, like, just like an MPO task force where we've got this group of people that gets together periodically and talks about the way they solve problems and, and so forth. It might be, it'd be a good idea to do that. So. Kevin, in your um, parks, do you have any stormwater ponds in your parks? We, we do. What do you spray in your stormwater? We don't spray anything in them. You don't spray anything? No. <laughs> no. Wow, so. very interesting. Is that something new that you just started, or you've been? Well, doing I'm going to check with Beth Powell. <laughs> well, her. Okay. Well, why don't uh, we have I, Beth I don't, up? And we're not. In we have stormwater areas and basins, but we're not. We're not spraying anything in them. Okay. Uh, well, Kevin, thank correct? you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. So, just to be clear, referencing stormwater in parks, of course, we have a stormwater management system. Again, our public works director is here. Uh, my understanding is he's not using any glyphosate-based products. In fact, he's uh, recently been experimenting with uh, a solution. Rich, you want to tell us about uh, the solution that you've, um, the solution is the solution in <laughs> yes. many cases, but, <laughs> but it's having varied results, and uh, Rich will explain what's going on in that area. Rich Sperger, the Public Works Director, Indian River County. So what we've been experimenting with is vinegar, dish soap, and salt. Say okay. that one more time. <laughs> vinegar, vinegar, dish soap, and salt. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I'm a slow learner. Thank you. <laughs> one more time. Vinegar. Yeah. Dish soap. Dish soap. And salt. Thank you. Oh. Dish soap. <laughs> so what we've been doing is experimenting. We got the idea from the in ags, from the ag people over in Building B, uh, from UF. They gave us the information. We've been experimenting with it. What we found is it's 50% effective. Um, which is better than spraying glyphosate, which we we do not use in public works. Uh, we have not used it since the end of July. Um, so we've been experimenting with that in our stormwater areas just to control the weeds. Uh, we also experiment it with it in our median islands uh, and around our facility. Again, it's 50% effective. We, um, we just we're trying to control the weeds as best we can by hand, but you can't really do that. Um, so we're, we've been using Tribune on a limited basis just to get the weeds that, that this mixture that we've been experimenting with uh, to keep the weeds under control. Uh, the city also uses it, City of Arrow. Um, and so far it's been successful, but again, we use it limited. We do not spray our ditches. Uh, we mechanically clean all of our ditches and uh, that we maintain. And please understand, we are not the Indian River Farms Water Control District. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the times you see ditch spraying going on in the county. That is not the county. That is a water control district, either Fellsmere, uh, SRID in your area, or the Indian River Farms Water Control District. Do you have a harvester in your toolbox? Excuse me? A harvester that goes into your waterways to? We do not have a floating harvester. Okay. Uh, what we have is uh, mechanical equipment on track hose and a rubber tired hose, um, gray dolls that we, it's a cutter head on it, and we use it to cut back the vegetation or mow. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we just don't look at just spraying stuff into the waters. We, like, we mechanically cut it like you would cut your lawn, and it, we let nature take its course. <laughs> if, if we had a harvester here, would you guys share in part of the expense? And that you, would you find a use for it? Depends on what type of harvester you're looking at. Okay. okay. It's a if, thought. Yeah. Well, you know, we will always look at options and partner with the cities to see if we mm -hmm. have a use for it. Right now, uh, we were going to get a harvester, 
uh, for our stormwater pond, but we found it's easier and quicker to use a, a track coat to clean them out on occasion. Mr. Mayor, I didn't have any other questions. Rich, that was very nice. Thank you very much for coming up. And yes, sure. Uh, um, uh, Eugene, you got to come up to, if you would. <laughs> I know, but it's just, you know, we got to get you on TV. Yeah, keep on process, uh, folks. 30% uh, industrial vinegar, 30% strength. We use vinegar off the shelf, white vinegar, but I don't know. Oh, that's only maybe 5%. Yeah. We okay. Yeah, so there's different doing. strengths. Sure, sure. And salt, Good kosher point. salt, I understand from most chefs, <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank All you, right. Rich. You appreciate that. Very informative. Thank you. So, and the third component is uh, exponentially more complicated in managing conservation lands because they are massive and the invasive species are aggressive and they're, they're, they're burdensome and heavy. So that has to be managed with uh, precision. And we are fortunate to have Beth Powell in charge of that endeavor, um, who is um, one of the most environmentally conscious professionals I've met in 20 years of government service mm -hmm. and with that I'll let her explain how and why uh, she manages the um, conservation lands invasive species eradication uh, in just the way she does. Beth. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. I'd be happy to give you a brief explanation. The work that um, I'm specifically in charge of is um, conservation area land management. So um, the county has partnered with the city of Sebastian, for instance, for North Sebastian Conservation Area right here in your backyard. Um, conservation land management uh, in regard to um, herbicides uh, would be slightly more complicated um, than um, other regular maintenance regimes. So one thing that I might, um, you know, if I were sitting in your um, seat and wearing your shoes, I would recommend that if you're gonna approach an integrated pest management plan for your count, you know, for the city, um, would be to segment different application um, reasons. So you have parks that you maintain and those have specific um, degrees of success that you want to see. And so um, obviously would be different than why waterways and canals. Um, I don't have that experience in aquatic vegetation management that other people would have, um, so I couldn't give you any you know, good information on that. Uh, I don't think that you guys manage um, any uh, environmentally sensitive areas um, outside of the airport area that um, we have a cooperative effort. Um, and of course, any of those areas I'd be happy to help you with. Or if you did identify areas that um, could be managed for conservation purposes, we would be happy to, um, to assist in any way. Uh, we do use herbicides um, as a regular part of our integrated pest management for conservation areas. And one of the strategies that I think is important to note is in integrated pest management, one of the things is to, um, uh, is to address a problem before it gets out of hand. And so that's something for all of the different areas that you guys are looking at right now that I would really encourage you to you know, look carefully at is um, any delay um, in treatment um, or, or something like that gonna requ require you to use more of something later. Um, any kind of uh, dredging or manipulation that you do to a land system has ill effects. Um, there's gonna be harm um, in anything that you're doing when you're doing that kind of management. Uh, for conservation areas, um, our herbicide uh, use is strategic to each species that we're treating. Um, generally, we don't use a lot of glyphosate, which is sort of the big um, topic, but there are lots of chemicals that are in our toolbox that we use. We're treating generally the same species over a period of time with the goal to eradicate that species. Once that species is successfully eradicated, the use of the herbicide would no longer be necessary. So that's why it's really important for us to stay on top of it. Some of the species that I would be um, uh, listing on, uh, if I were you, would be Old World Climbing Fern, which is um, a, an invasive uh, vine that is becoming more prevalent in, on, in our area, probably due to the lack of uh, hard freezes in our area for um, since uh, probably 2006 or seven, uh, when we had a hard freeze. Um, that is uh, a species is very common. If you wanna look at some examples, I would pull up information from Martin County and Palm Beach 
Beach County where it, it, it expands so fast. So that'd be a priority species. Um, we call that early detection rapid response. That would be a species that you would want to keep an eye on. And those do proliferate in canal systems. Uh, and when they get out of hand, they can be really problematic. So identifying what it is that you're controlling and why you're controlling it, I think, is an important aspect to each of those segments, however you broke it out, that would make the most sense sense for your staff um, and or your contractors that you're using. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I like that. Did you have, did you have any organic uh, secret uh, chemicals that uh, you're using? Uh, we don't use any organic chemicals. Um, I, uh, because I'm a licensed sprayer, um, I would be using any um, uh, herbicide based on its label. Uh, I am very cautious about using um, herbicides that are not labeled for the plant that I'm treating. I have best management practices that are provided through uh, the University of Florida. We follow those uh, for each of the species. So um, some of these other things are not necessarily have been studied. So we're using what's been studied over a period of time and that we know that works. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah okay. that was gonna feel, okay. Mr. Mayor, oh, Mr. Mayor, with your permission, is there somebody in the audience would like to ask Beth a question? Are you using goats now? Are we using goats? We are using, uh, we have two pilot projects um, utilizing goats. I do want to preface that with saying it is not without its challenges. So <laughs> goats are not, <laughs> they're adorable creatures. Um, but the, the Bob, I'll tell you what we've learned so far because um, uh, you did come out and take a look. Brian actually came out and um, Paul came out and took a look. And at the time you guys came out, we were in a mess. We had uh, goat escape problems. We had uh, goats everywhere. And I was pulling my hair out. Uh, so I, I can't tell you whether or not a go goats would be a good solution for you. But what I can tell you is that what we've learned so far is that goats are browsers. They are not grazers. So they're not going to eliminate the vegetation to beyond a certain point. They're really, I guess, kind of efficient, and maybe you call it lazy, but I would call it efficient. They like to eat what is at their the height of their mouths. So you, I was kind of expecting the goats to go through and kind of mow down an area, which apparently sheep will do, sheep and, and cattle and things like that. Uh, but we've had some challenges, and it's extremely expensive. Um, we've spent, uh, we have a $10,000 work order for an area that would be approximately now because they've pretty much eaten everything it's winter time um, so uh, within an eight month work order six month work order for ten thousand dollars I mean you know there's a cost to that uh, there's fencing involved there's escape management issues uh, and then the question for us is going to be what long-term result do we have as opposed to um, mechanical or herbicide treatment that we might normally use in order to give the natural system a hand up so that it can proliferate and become a natural system, um, you know, this would stand on its own. So that's what we've learned so far. We'll be happy to share our experience with you. That would be great. Success and failures. <laughs> sure. Oh. So um, the University of Florida just released um, or has started releasing the Brazilian pepper thrips. Uh, for your waterways and things like that, Brazilian pepper is probably less of an issue or less of a problem than it might be in maybe your parks or other areas. But the good news is that after 20 years of research, um, Brazilian pepper thrips have been released. They are being released. Uh, Melaleuca uh, weevil and the beetle have also been released. We have really good results. Uh, so again, this is integrated pest management. It's utilizing all the tools in our toolbox, using them together and using them effectively. Um, but we do have those two new uh, little agents in our community. Uh, the melaleuca weevils are already out in abundance. Uh, so when you have melaleuca stands, if you're cutting or treating those, uh, they do help with the regrowth. They're not going to take um, and destroy an entire uh, adult, mel you know, like a, a kind of a climax community of melaleuca. But if you were to go in and cut those and treat those, you can actually delay spraying for quite some time with the new sprouts that are coming up. Um, we have one project where they were released, and we haven't had to retreat that area for about 10 years. We're having to treat it now. So the retreatment is necessary, but we've had 10 years where we didn't have to spray. So that's a big success. And thanks to UF for all the work that they do. 
Go Gators. Yes, go Gators. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. No, Beth that was can I ask you a question, question, Beth? On that thrift, they released that in Davie. Have they allowed it to be released anywhere else yet? It uh, was yeah. released at one of our sites, yeah. Okay. So um, the Cattlemen's Association, to the best of my understanding, is the one that is funding uh, the release of the initial release of the thrips. Uh, so the releases are being strategically done now, um, uh, primarily in cattle, all the uh, cattle areas, uh, but they're also, uh, some were released um, off of County Route 510. Uh, close to Sebastian and the question at this point in time once they release them there are only certain studies that they can do so the studies that they're doing now is how far how quickly do they move out of those areas once they um, have kind of infiltrated other areas that study will be over and essentially the thrips will be released if you were to go to Melaleuca stand um, that's what they did with the Melaleuca beetles uh, you would see Melaleuca beetles and weevils pretty much in any stand um, and that's because you know they release them slowly do certain studies and then eventually the the thrips will um, the Brazilian pepper thrips will be like the weevils yeah. right. Beth, um, if not yourself who would be the best resource to like identify these invasive species directly in our canals um, so, um, like the, so the uh, plumbing yeah. firm for example I don't you cover a lot more area than us right so so in your canal systems um, if you were to do an assessment, you there would have two assessments, I think. One would be the management for the function of the canal system. You have to maintain that with, in, in a certain way, and I'm not certain what that way would be. And that would be the first thing. The second thing would be, do you have invasive species that could potentially spread outside to other areas? And there are, um, you know, there are a lot of local folks who have done similar endeavors um, on the St. Sebastian River. I know the Friends Group has, has done some, um, some points and made some notes as to where, for instance, Old World Climbing Fern is. So you could potentially uh, use volunteers. Uh, you could do, um, there's a, FWC has uh, an invasive species um, app where you can actually report um, your sightings of different invasive species, and it also, that app helps you to identify them. Uh, University of Florida, the IFAS, um, could identify any plant. I've taken plants in myself before that I didn't know what they were, so I would cut that and take that into the IFAS, um, and they're able to look it up and find it. You can also just snap a picture and email it to them. If they don't know who it is, they know who will know, and that's how we've identified certain plants before. Uh, you know, there's pretty common uh, invasive species that I think we have a link on our webpage, but I'm sure University of Florida does as well, all the different invasive species that you could be looking for in your area and reporting that. A couple different ways to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Institute of Food and Agriculture Sciences. Sciences. Yeah. yeah. What? It's an extension a, of the University of Florida? Yeah, that's an extension. Uh, Beth, what's your um, your education? I have a bachelor's degree from the oh. University of Tennessee Go Balls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, you, you were wonderful. Thank you. And uh, so was Rich and the team. Thank you so much for coming and, and being a part of our, our program here. Mr. Mayor? Huh? Um, Do we have any other comments from Mr. the... Uh, Mr. Zito, did you want to say anything in closing for your team? No, so we're here ready, willing, and able to cooperate with your staff. We do have regular communication through our parks division. Kevin is very proactive in this area, thank so you. we're here to help. T tell thank Jason you. Brown, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, do we have any other comments? Bob, you gonna keep it clean? One minute. All right. No I wanna ask a question, but I wanted to ask it of her, and she's left. Beth. No, you yeah. haven't. Uh, and that is, I just planted 40,000 trees, and I'm really wary about releasing all these strange and unusual insects that work on one, but are they going to work on the other? So I planted 40,000 trees, and will I soon find out that this thrip, what did you call it, a thrum or what? Thrip? Thrip. Thrips. Thrips. Yeah. Will I know, I mean, if I see one, will I have to swat it or what? George, let her, let her elaborate. So as I said, the University of Florida um, uh, IFAS has worked on the development of the Brazilian pepper thrips for over 20 years.
Um, these insects that are released now undergo incredible scrutiny and study prior to being released into, uh, into our environment. The Brazilian pepper thrips, and I'll give you just my basic understanding, um, because we're working with researchers who know um, a whole host more than I do. Um, uh, Kiri Mentir uh, is the one that we're working with, and I would be happy to forward that contact information to you guys as her. well. I've been working with her. Okay, good. So uh, my, the, to the best of my understanding, again, um, the thrips, this particular um, species has been studied for over 20 years in quarantine. Uh, what they look at is what uh, host plants uh, the thrips uh, feed on. These thrips don't eat or gnaw down the entire tree. They're only feeding on the tips and the new growth on the branches, which essentially starts to starve the plant uh, over a period of time. It's not something where you're going to see the entire plant stripped and defo defoliated. You would start to see a diseased plant. Uh, the, the, this particular thrips does come from South America, uh, but again, it's been studied along with many, many other species um, in order to ensure that there are no other species um, that would be injured or harmed by this particular thrips. It's very small. It's not a very um, sexy plant, or sexy little insect. Uh, the Melaleuca um, beetle is very cute, kind of <laughs> looks like a, a ladybug in, in, a, in a way. This guy's just sort of a regular bug, but um, he's a little going to be a little superhero in um, in our state, I think. He's really going to give us a hand. So the answer to your question would be, I have a lot of confidence in the University of Florida's studies and in the endeavor that they've undertaken for 20 years that I could say, uh, if your plants die because of the thrips, I'll come help you replant some more. <laughs> 40, hold, hold on one second, Betsy. Diane? What are the cost of these bugs? Because I think that's a great idea. And do we have to be careful about spraying around them? I can't give you the exact cost of the rearing. Um, I do know with the weevils uh, that they used uh, for the Melaleuca beetles and weevils, those were all funded by grants. Um, and again, uh, for the initial release of the Brazilian pepper thrips, that's being funded by the Florida Cattlemen's Association for this release. So there's different segments of the work that I'm sure are funded um, through different strategies. And what was your second question? Oh, spraying. Um, Uh, that would be a great question um, for the researchers. I, I think that's something that possibly they would be looking at. Um, although on the site that we're working on, we have not been asked. We're not spraying in the immediate area that they were released in, uh, but we have no other restrictions outside of that immediate area because they're really looking at where the bug, you know, where the bugs are going to go, basically how they're going to spread. Um, on and it, I guess it would depend on what you're spraying too. Are you spraying peppers? Are you spraying grasses? Old world climbing fern. Well, we yeah. In our areas, we wouldn't be applying insecticides. So. Great. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Cox. I just want to say Graham Cox, 1213 George Street. I just want to say the folks in the county have made my day uh, being able to come and share what they, what they know and I urge the city to take advantage of all they can help with. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stevens? I'll try to cut it short and Keep it constructive. <laughs> Stay now, give me a break here. Uh, Ms. Paris, we have an environmental technician uh, on the payroll, it'd be nice if we could bring her involved in this and let her do a job. She would tell the public what invasive and what wasn't. You know, if she's not capable of doing her job, Mr. Uh, Carlisle, maybe we need a different environmental tech. I don't know. I'm not going to try to micromanage your business there, but she should be here. I don't see her. Thank you, sir. Bob, so, please don't accuse anybody. No oh, accusations okay. of anybody. So, okay. one, one, on the last thing, please, Mr. Mayor. Could you invite the county to our meetings, and and, and that would be appropriate. We all—they're always invited. No, yes. they, they tell me they're not invited. Well, so please invite the county to our next meetings. Thank you. Do we have any other people that persons? Yes, sir. My name is uh, Armand Cushane. I live at 677 Wimbro Drive. <clears throat> 
I'm a graduate of Long Beach State College in California University now. Um, I don't know if you remember dichloral, diphenyl trichloroethane. I'm giving away my age. The chemists probably know it. It's a DDT. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was taking an ornithology course, and my degree was in zo. Uh, and I was asked to go in a, to count California condors, and then majestic, beautiful bird. And things were really dire. I think we were down to 37. And we counted them, and it was a, a great experience. And they rebounded because they stopped DDT. Now, I am really conflicted in what I hear today. I really enjoy what this young lady has to say. Um, she's got a wealth of information, and we really need to listen to her. Um, but I was a, a school teacher and a principal, and my concern was always the kids. It was a, in one case, I was in a city principal, and we had a problem with the rats, and I was concerned that on that playground, they had used pressure-treated wood, the old stuff, and the rats, and they used old tires, and the rats would love to nest in those places. So I learned a great deal from the city uh, dealing with these issues. But I was also concerned because the rats were dying in our playground and what that meant for our kids. Now, we think we have a real genuine problem, but I think it's solvable, thanks to some of the people here that are instrumental in this. Um, and I'm an optimistic, but I think we need to protect the kids first of all. What I like to see is that of all we're protecting ourselves, but we really need to protect our kids. If you're using harsh chemicals on the playgrounds, the soccer fields, football fields, baseball fields, volleyball, you know, out here, um, we really need to be careful about how we're treating those areas, especially if it's flooding over and these chemicals are getting into the grass. Um, I'm not gonna take a lot of time. I thank you for being here and um, attacking this problem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any more comments? Anybody? Well, if there's no further comments, I'll turn it back over to the mayor and we can uh, wrap this up. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask uh, the council members uh, my, and that if we could actually maybe put together our notes um, and send a copy of those, maybe in some word processing format, and send a copy of them to the city manager and so he can kind of combine those things or have uh, his administrative system combine them so we have a, a comprehensive list. We, it's the simplest way I know for us to try to get a comprehensive list of the comments that came through, uh, if, if you don't mind doing that. Well, m Mr. Mayor, most of my notes came from the people that came here today. So when we do the minutes, you'll be happy to get them transcribed and everything that was said here okay. is what I have well, here. Well, okay, I'm, I'm gonna type up my notes and provide them to the city manager so, so he can. I've got, okay, the, and if oh. you don't mind doing that, Nope. Uh, typing up your notes and providing city managers I mean, to put together, uh, that was put together the, something. I, and I understand. Yeah, that's, that's fine. the purpose of getting everybody's yeah. name and identification yeah. here. Yeah. And there was some really good information. And so okay, now let me uh, let me kind of talk about where we're going. This is the the second of two workshops that were originally scheduled. Uh, what we're what we're going to do this the next step is for the city manager to put together the information related to the to the to what was talked about by the people here and to try to put together some form of a, um, I'll call it a beginning document because <laughs> developing an integrated pest management plan, and I'm, I appreciate very much the comments that I've heard from people like Dr. Cox and so forth, it's not a simple task to do that. It's not something that can be done in, in, in a quick manner. Um, and if we're gonna put one together for the city, we have to then, we have to take these practices that people have recommended that we do, we have to wrap that around the specific problem. I heard a very good comment come a few minutes ago from one of the county people. You have to define what you're accomplishing and your goals are for a specific area, and then you put to get that together. And the city manager has a, a pretty good handle on the specific areas. And if he combines that with the comments that we've received, and with anything he can find, I, I, I know, Mr. Stevens, I agree with you 100%. People in California sometimes are crazy. But uh, when Councilwoman Ferris found this document and asked for it to be printed and sent it to us, 
I looked at it, and quite frankly, it's, a, it's an extremely good document, so it's a pattern that we can use, or it's the beginning of a pattern that we can use. And um, the way that they do it out there is, is I think, I, I used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I will tell you, I don't, I don't give them credit for much of anything, but um, the way they do it is they have, uh, they have integrated online systems that all of their staff uses, and if, if, they're, if they have a problem that they're trying to solve, and it involves a need to control a pest of any kind, they have to go into this integrated system and identify the acceptable solution. They're broken down into tiers, tier one through tier three. They have to use the lowest tier product that they could use, and then they have to prove that that low tier product doesn't work before they go to the next tier. It's, it's kind of a, uh, a well thought out process, but it's done by a county that has a population of about a million five hundred thousand people has more money than we'll ever have. Um, so they were able to put a lot of effort in this. So we should, we should use it. And we should try to find integrated pest management plans from other places. I don't know if there's anybody in Florida that's actually produced one of these. Maybe there is. So we should try to find one IFAS and put that together. It. So, excuse IFAS, me? IFAS has it. Okay. And uh, so we go to IFAS and do it. But um, so we're going to try to bring that. F first, the city manager will try to take these ideas and bring them back into his understanding of what the problem is. He's, he's got the canals broken down. He's broken that stuff down. And the next step for us is to, is to then get back into a public forum and talk about how we can apply these specific ideas to each of the areas within the city and how we can do that, that process as we go. We have more problems than just spraying. Uh, we have a failing canal system, and we have to clean that canal system out, which means there's going to be a need to dredge. It's going to be a need for us to manually get in there and clean out Brazilian peppers. It's going to be a need for us to manually clean out cabbage palms. Uh, and, and there's going to be a need for us to do a lot of work like that. We can't do, because we can't afford to do, all of that work at one time. We have to do that in segments, which means we're going to begin to apply these best management practices as we go through that process. We may well have to even deal with failing canal walls in those segments as we go through that. That's another issue, totally separate from this, but it's all part of the whole process of trying to put together a city integrated plan to fix this, the problem. The golf course is much simpler. It's standalone. We can, uh, we can have the golf course manager talk to the Pelican Island Audubon Society people and talk about the, uh, whether the Audubon process brings us any, any value or not. Uh, the parks are a separate issue from that. We can, our parks manager, uh, the, the director of leisure services can try to find more organically oriented products to treat what he needs to treat. And we can, we can actually isolate and separate those from the canal system and from the wastewater system as we go forward. So, we probably can make some quicker progress on those parts, on the golf course and the park, than we can on the canal. So we can we can go forward with that. Um, I, I th the city, the decision has been made in the city, and it, it doesn't need to be made again. It's old news. I think I heard the Charles at the Natural Resources Board say that was yesterday. Mm -hmm. We're not going to use these nasty chemicals. We're going to create an integrated pest management plan, and we're going to attack solving our problems as as uh, ecologically uh, uh, ecologically positive as we can. That doesn't mean we're not going to spray something possibly where it has to be done. Right now, I don't know what that is because I don't know what the alternatives are. We have to identify those alternatives. Uh, this well product, this this uh, and I, you just did the step thing. That's exactly what I liked about this California document. Tier one, tier two, tier three. Stop, so, solve it at the at the, the the best tier first. If that doesn't work, go to the. And they actually have Roundup on tier three, but they're very selective. They're very selective on. Um, and they they understood when they put this document together that there it, it it it's the only thing that does what it does. And there may be an instance where you can justify it, but you have to justify it. You have to actually go through the process of justifying. I don't know that we don't have a solution. We've got this, this whack out weeds product that appears right now from our testing is, going to, is as effective as Roundup, and it's basically peppermint oil. Yeah, that's and and uh, so if it's as effective as Roundup, then we find that our worst case is to use WOW as opposed to trying to use something like, like glyphosate or whatever. So that's our next steps. I, 
I, I just want to summarize once again what the conversation that Councilmember Gillians and I had about a committee. It's not that simple for a government to do that. We have to charter these things. I mean, I, I'll tell you right now, for the people in this room, everybody in this room has a common theme. Treat this as, as correctly as you can and as friendly to the environment as you can be. But if we take a, if we take a step without going through the proper processes, somebody in this city who doesn't agree with the people in this room will throw that in our face. And now we have a different problem to deal with. The reason that the governments have to go through those things, the reason we have to do things like charter this stuff and to properly define it, is because not everybody believes the same way. And we have to make sure that when we take the steps that we've done them correctly. We already have a good group in the Natural Resources Board. There, there's, the, the Natural Resources Board has some highly qualified people on it. So we already have a good group that if, if in fact it turns out that, that we want to bring a chartered committee to, to bear, that might be the best place for us to bring it. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, because that, that's something that the city manager has to, to think about, and that's something we have to talk about doing. But we have to make sure that we move forward in such a way that we don't create a bigger problem for ourselves. No matter what we do, no matter what we do, when we say we're gonna spend money, there will be people that will say, why did you go along with those idiots? And I'm not calling you guys idiots, I believe you. But there's people that's gonna say that, and they're gonna challenge it, and they're gonna come after us. So we have to that make sure a, we've got it right. Mr. Mayor, that was a poor cho choice of words. <laughs> okay, w with, those, with those environmentalists, that, that, thank that's you. better. Thank you, thank I mean, you. Come on. And, and, but I mean, we have to be very careful that we do look it the bad. right way. So I think I, I'm, I'm comfortable that we got a lot of good input. And I'm comfortable that we can begin the process of moving forward with this. Mr. Mayor, I have a few things also before yes, you close ahead. the meeting. Ladies first, would you like to? Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm happy with the progress. I'm new at council this year and last year, November, and I'm just now painfully understanding the slow process that legislation has. Believe me, I'm so excited about this. I want it done tomorrow, but really, diligently, it has to be done a certain way, unfortunately. But I have to express the urgency of the parks due to public input, and <coughs> I'm all about public input. I want what you people want. I'm one of you. Unfortunately, we're a little divided, but I think we can also come to terms. But there's huge outrage about my kids are grown, they don't play soccer in the fields anymore, but um, I think we need to put a urgent on that particular project, the fire ants. Thank you, Councilman Pamela. Um, we have the finance director here. Ken, can you tell us how much money we have in the stormwater management account? Approximately, you don't have to. I think there's a, a balance now about seven, seven, seven hundred, seven hundred fifty thousand. Okay, and how much do we bring annually in in taxation on the uh, stormwater fees? It's uh, close to two million. Two million annually. Yes. Okay, so it's seven hundred thousand. Okay, just so that the public understands what uh, we've been collecting. The uh, the second thing, Mr. Mayor, I want to treat this as code red. I don't want to procrastinate no more. Uh, it's like a hurricane, like a storm. You put your people, you get them together, you devise a plan. We have to have two plans. We have to have a long-term plan, and we have to have a short-term plan. Obviously, the, the community is divided. Uh, I'm not sure if they're educated enough to understand what we're up against. Uh, we're trying to appease everybody. This tr we're trying to compromise with everybody. Uh, obviously, we have to make these decisions as a group. Um, so that's why I recommended that not a committee, but a, t a task force you put together quickly. And we come up with problems, I mean solutions to problems quickly so that we can appease everybody in the community. Um, I'm a little disappointed that our environmentalist was not at our workshops. So for the future, when we do have workshops, if you feel that, that it's pertinent to have them here, which I think it is, they should be here. Say with the attorney, if you feel that you think there's liability by us moving too quickly, that's why we have an attorney on staff. They need to be here so we can ask. Um, I'm very happy with the workshops. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that everybody's spread out in the room. I'd like to see you all come up to the front and be involved a lot closer so we're together. Um, I think that's important. There's no reason for us to be all spread out in the room. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Surely, Mr. Vice Mayor Malthick. 
I just want to thank the county for joining us. I'd like to thank the county for joining us in this meeting today. I think it was very informative. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, I, and I agree with your comments about, about speed. I think we can, we can move aggressively on the parks and on the golf course. And uh, we'll have to move less aggressively on the canals sure. uh, than that, but we can move pretty aggressively on the parks and the golf course. Um, and so the city manager can, can kind of put together something where we try to do that. I, I, I think the parks, the comment that was made about you have to not let it get ahead of you was an extremely good one, uh, especially about our Barber Street complex. We can't continue to let it get ahead of us. So what we have to do is try to find some agents that we can use in Barber Street that, that are not toxic or not as toxic as, as whatever and and try to move forward with that um, so I think we can move quickly as quickly as possible <laughs> boy every time I say government can move quickly I have to I, I get a I get a shock in the in the back of my head uh, you know but as quickly as governments can move on the on the parks and the golf course but uh, and particularly the parks the golf course is not as big a problem as, as people think it is uh, they, they seem to have they're they're pretty in pretty good shape and and if we can get the Audubon system set up in there we'll be in pretty good shape with that so um, I have no issue with that and um, I want to thank everybody for coming I want to thank people for their input um, uh, we're going to continue to try to get as much input as possible on a, a lot of things if we can um, uh, and so I think it's important to get community involvement in what we do Mr. So, Mayor, is it safe to say that we'll see something on the next agenda? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the city manager to answer that question because he has to put together the plan on, on, the, on the, the parks. Is it safe to say that we might be able to have talk about that on the next agenda? Brian's been working diligently on looking at all kinds of alternatives, and he's reached out to several different communities to see what they use. Let's see what he comes up with in the next week because we only have a week and a half to get the agenda together. Okay. Short period of time, and we'll see what we can get together. Okay. I mean, at least maybe give us a progress report. Th if, exactly. If that was can. my next point. If, if you haven't really heard from everybody, at least, I'll have at least draft give us a progress report. I'll have him draft a memo for you okay. on this progress. Yeah, and and until Sorry. we get this Thank problem you. resolved, if, Mr. Mayor, yeah, that would be great. The progress report at every yeah. agenda meeting that we have yeah. so that we can keep the community up to date what we're doing absolutely okay. thank you so much all right anyone else have anything they want to come talk about sir i just want to ask a question Somebody come, come right there if you would i, I know this is not <laughs> applicable to that i woke up yesterday morning and i walked out to my mailbox and there's red writing I mean, is somebody trying to get even with me or something? I mean, what is uh, this? If, if there's red writing on the ground, there's on been the, a survey or do something there, and it may well be it's part long. of it. It's about this long. What does it say? Well, the city, the, the county that. is replacing all the water meters if you're on county water, and it may be you're in an area where they're doing that. There's also a lot of work being done by Pike on the transmission systems. It's only on my side, only on my side and it's yeah. no place else. So I know. So I just wonder if there's a devil out there that's trying to get even with Typically, me. if it's red on the on the ground, it's some survey or marking something. It's red on the mechanic. Okay. It's a Valentine message. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> stop me before I kill more. Somebody is that what loves you, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Can I address some of that just so they know? Yes. You'll be seeing. And I meant to mention this last night, and I was remiss in doing it. I've been working with Vincent Burke with the county. We're going to try to get some information out on our website. They're going to be replacing like 37,000 water meters throughout the whole county with uh, radio read meters, which will be more efficient, more accurate, and to help them keep account of water loss and, and, and be more accurate in their billing. So as you see people digging out in your front yard, it's probably them. But uh, the, when they do locate, you'll see red for power, green for sewer, blue for water. They'll do different co codes, color codes as they do locates before they can dig. So, but for the citizens, we'll be putting on our website the link to the county's information line on the meter. So if you have questions, I just I was going to mention it last night because they're going to be hitting it in full force. And uh, we'll try to get that information on our website to help the county get their information out. Thank you. Okay, we are adjourned.